Hi, everybody, and thanks for listening. This is Richard Miller in the Plangier Culture Lab at Rutgers University. On today's episode of Time with a Creative Mind, I'll be speaking with Carolyn Steedman of Warwick University. Professor Steedman is an internationally renowned social and labor historian whose work has been influential in understanding the construction of childhood, the role of servants and soldiers in 18th century and 19th century British history. I was most interested in speaking with Professor Steedman, however, because of her first book, The Tidy House, which discusses a short story that three young children wrote in a class she was teaching very early in her career. Through her approach, she's able to take the story of these children and speak about the construction of childhood, the role of female labor in pedagogy of, for the young, and issues of class as they define the experiences of young people in the classroom. I hope you enjoy the conversation. I'd actually like to, to start with Tidy House, if we could. Of course. Because I'm, I'm fascinated by the way you as a writer move between so many different genres. And there's a, an incredible courage in this book where you say, I'm going to write an entire book about a short story three little children mm -hmm. wrote in four days. Mm -hmm. So how did you come to do that? It's clear from the book, isn't it, that I was teaching those children. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I was there during those four days. I think in retrospect, I was just doing what I've done in a, a great many of my later books, and that is I have found or come across a text, a document, usually in archives, and thought, this is extraordinary. I have to do something with it. Mm -hmm. So even though I wasn't working as an academic historian, I behaved like a historian mm -hmm. in that way. And I connected very much to the radical soldier's tale. I don't know if you've come across mm -hmm. yes. That, yes. that extraordinary, what is it, autobiography, memoir, ego, histoire of um, a man who on the face of it, you know, certainly occupied a conservative position in society as an agent of British imperialism in India, comes home and joins the Buckinghamshire Constabulary in the 1850s. And obviously, for over 30 years, he just keeps quiet about his radicalism, his republicanism, his feelings about what he calls the goddess Victoria, sarcastically, church and state, Britain's imperialism. And then when he's retired, he sits down and tells that story. And it is an extraordinary testimony to the, you know, to the intelligence and perception of ordinary people. And I felt with, uh, when I um, came across John Pierman's memoir, is what he called it, I felt the same kind of thing as I did when I had the story together. I have to do something with this. Mm -hmm. This is amazing. It's amazing for a number of reasons, because there you are, you're a teacher in a classroom, mm -hmm. and your students have done something, and it's, it's, it's frequently, it, it's uncommon for a teacher to feel like this object has this profound historic resonance, yes. right? That, that you're able to look at this object and see it not only as the product of four children that you know well, but located both in its moment and then as a, a piece of something that's going to help you understand childhood more broadly. Yes. And that there's this chance element. That's fascinating yes. to me. So does chance figure for you as an essential part of the writing process? N not so much of the writing process. Mm -hmm. I, it figures as central part of the research process, because everything a historian finds to work on is there by chance. 
archives and record offices are just full of flotsam and jetsam, stuff that no one intended to be there. People's account books and shopping lists that were shoved into the back of some other document and then 75 years later driven off to the local record office by a grandson. So it's, there's always happenstance in finding historical documents like this. So I think chance, amazing chance, and feeling that you're able to recognize it when it comes along mm -hmm. is a very important part of the, well, you could say the pre-writing process, but I don't think it's part of the actual process of writing. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. It's luck. I would call it luck. So I, I'm really struck, you know, I mean, uh, as a writing teacher, writing appears before you endlessly. And, mm. and one, one could imagine yes. a book, I indeed written by you, that was focused on the labor of churning yes. through the next stage, not of dirty yes. nappies, but of papers, yes. right? Yes. And yet this object appears before you. And, and you use this fascinating phrase here. You said you wanted to do right by it. Yes. And that to me seems to be a way of naming your relationship to the archive consistently through all of your work. That there's a there's an ethics when you say you want to do right mm -hmm. by it, but it's it's quite clearly not the ethics of E. P. Thompson or the ethics of Karl Marx. That you're very much in dialogue with those guys about what it yeah. means to tell uh, the story of people who, for whom we only have fragments of mm. evidence as a go mm. um. I think I feel a great deal of responsibility. I think that's the best word mm -hmm. for describing my relationship to these texts and documents. But I do think that E.P. Thompson felt that sense of responsibility as well <sighs> towards retrieving those lost lives, those unconsidered lives. In fact, that's what he says at the beginning of the making of the it, English working it, class. Yeah, I guess I meant that you're not reclaiming the same lives or the same aspects of the lives that, that he sought to retrieve. Obviously, I see you in, as a fellow traveler with E.P. Thompson, but that you're, you're really adding this other the layer of the servants mm. and uh, the wonderful and haunting story you tell of Girl. And need, and, and I think maybe in the piece you actually say, you know, you want to complicate the idea that that the area that E.P. Thompson was focused on was exclusively about Methodism. Mm -hmm. and yes, um, or that it was exclusively about men, that it was exclusively yes. about radical, overtly politicized men who made the English working class. Yes, and you know that it wasn't about all those people at home who. You know, Auden's poem, you know, uh, uh, Musée des de Beaux-Arts, Beaux where um, ordinary life goes on, and yet the historical process seems to be taking place. Mm. So an astonishing mm. thing happens, a boy falls from the sky, but there's the plowman and the horse who are just getting on. I think I, I want to try always to deal with the plowman and the horse. Yeah in relationship to the boy, you know, the big historical moment and event, and to acknowledge that people are very, very complicated, and complication is intelligence, and perhaps not all of them could live up to E.P. Thompson's demands on them mm -hmm. from 200, 150 years later to be the kind of working class protester and thinker that he wanted in the 1960s. Right. So I hope I'm able to recognize people's ambivalence and, you know, their bloody-mindedness and their, well, you've got a word in this land, or orneriness. Ornery, yes, actually, yeah. Well, and also melancholy. Yes. And envy. Uh, and their complexity and, as and well. That you're concerned to represent a desire for a better life, not as false consciousness. Mm. You're so interested in 
how people come to read and displacing a dominant theory about how people come to write, that there's that morality is central. Mm. And, and I just touch on this book by mm. saying you're interested in the role that fairy tale mm. plays in shaping expectation. Mm. Now, fairy tales are, of course, richly, symbolically mm. complicated, but they're also, in another way, very simple stories. So I'm trying to figure out how, how we get from the power of the fairy tale, which, which seems to organize the way, in some ways, the way that kids are thinking in the tidy house, right? To the level of reading that, that you're doing, and E.P. Thompson is doing. I'd extend fairy tale, which is actually quite a limited okay. category, to uh -huh. a much broader question of how all manner of people, past and present, appropriate. Do you know the work of Roger Chartier, the oh, sure. French historian? Yeah, the history of books. So much he's done. And it, that is his key idea that I've always found enormously productive to think with. You know, that it's not so much reading that we should be after, but attempting to understand ways in which people appropriate yeah. text. Yeah. The many ways in which they take it on board, interpret it, incorporate it in themselves. To return to me, you take what to the reader seems like a very thin sliver of information. Mm. She's murdered this and confessed and she bought the arsenic. Uh, she was called a dirty slug. Uh, she was hung, but we don't, we don't have any evidence of whether anybody came. You take that then you have an article and you create a world. And to my mind, you read it with a kind of poetic imagination. Maybe that is related to the kind of reading that, the, a way of taking up fairy tales or children's literature or any kind of information. But it's not the kind that's taught in school, where you're supposed to read it and say, well, what happened? She killed the kid. Or they don't even read it, right? I mean, partly you spend your life reading things that people don't even bother to read. Yes. I mean, you're a historian. You use this as a way to tell us about the history of childhood and the history of what it meant to be responsible for cleaning up after another kid. So, so you take this little teeny pile of information and you, you blow it up into a whole world. And so I, I, I'm interested in, in that as a, as a reading practice, okay. right? As a way of appropriating text. Well, I... I blow it up as a whole world in a perfectly recognizably historical way. Yes. I mean, the inflation is to do with known facts yes. and circumstances in 1800 England. And th those were extremely hard years, which our conventional histories tend to ignore, a series of famines, the countries at war with the French, it's had a debilitating war with the Americans, of course, before the Revolutionary yeah. Wars. These wars are going to go on for a very long time. Because I knew this and found out more about it because of the Anne Mead story, because I wanted to place what you call a little, little pile of information yeah. into some kind of context that did some of the work of experience explaining her actions. I mean, it's highly particular. I mean, it's my interpretation. I think it's quite clear what my position on this terrible act. She murdered a baby out of utter desperation. Let me just pick up where you said, you know, yes, what you did is, when, when you blew this up, you did it as a historian. So, and this actually gets to a question that I want to come to at the end, because you mentioned on Tuesday, you said, I want to grow up and be a writer. When I grow up. When I grow up. Right? Well, I want um, to be a writer. Um, and, you know, obviously those of us in the audience are thinking, I think you're already a writer. But, but I understand that, that that's a really important distinction yes. for you, and, and I, t I take that very seriously. So, so you have this way of taking something that's very particular, you do it in the tidy house, it's not your method, but it, it characterizes that you 
you pay homage to this archival material and then you pull it up through a loom of history but you do it in a way that's very particular so I, I, I'm wondering when you were in the class teaching how did you know take the story and make make what these kids had written about their tidy house and kids slapping mm. each other and and turn that into something that goes back to Mayhew and Dickens and tells us all about the history of childhood in England for the past 150 years. Well, because it was a particular imagination, mine, and a particular cultural and literary formation at work, mainly as a, a, a product of my education. It was filtered through my consciousness, my knowledge, my political convictions. I don't think historians do, in fact, try to tell the seamless, authoritative narrative that is a kind of truth, though sometimes they're accused of doing that. But I did it my way, I suppose. I did it in the only way I could. As I mentioned, you know, my overarching interest is in, for advanced writers, the threat is always that you're just going to keep writing the same thing over and over and yeah. over again. And what is so striking to me about the arc of your career is that your pieces are certainly in conversation with each other. It's not discontinuous, but it's not the same story over and over again. That, that you go into the archive and having written The Tidy House, you then come back and say, I'm going to write about a dream. And I, I, that's all I'll say about that book, mm. but I think that's an extraordinary move to say, here's this dream I had, and I'm going to write about it, and it's not going to be about me. I mean, and I know that's your position, mm. and I actually think that that's the best way to read mm. the book, that it's not about you, it's mm. not about your mom. Mm. The dream captures, in some sense, uh, the imaginary of the time. And then, where do you go next? You, know, you go into soldier mm. journals, you go into the criminal... Mm. There's something about, a, 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 to me, a, a generosity in your openness to what's going to be the thing that surprises you. Well, thank you for saying that about my mother, my albatross, <laughs> um, <laughs> which is the most comprehensible remark about it, I think, that anyone has ever made. So thank you very much. I mean, to me, it, what you say about it, that makes. I, I think you're a very good reader. Thank, so thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> I think, and this does sound a bit pious, but I feel a great sense of gratitude for having been given the imagination I have mm -hmm. and the reading and writing skills I was given. And as a historian, I would place those abilities, I would place that imagination in a history of the post-Second World War settlement, what historians call the settlement, the social democratic settlement, when most Western societies set out to educate and nourish, literally nourish, children in a way they had never done before. And I see my writing beginning in the elementary school classroom. And in these huge South London classes, you know, with 45 children in them, the way in which we were all encouraged to write. I mean, it's also a very good way of keeping children occupied. Which Writing taught them how to write. <laughs> is a way of keeping them quiet. But I remember lovely Mr. Veal, who one day I would really like to write about when I was um, eight years old, who seemed to me at the time, you know, old, but I now realize must have been in his, only in his late 20s, right. and was part of that special scheme whereby um, ex-soldiers, those who served in the army, mm. were trained very quickly for Some the, kind of the, the boom in, in uh, births. I mean, I belong to the bulge, as it's called in mm. England. You know, yes. there were more children born in the month I was born than had ever been... I've been, always been accompanied by a great demographic 
crowd in my right when it's my, your birthday <laughs> right <laughs> there are no was, cakes in the pantry then no. right <laughs> <laughs> yeah they get there first <laughs> but somehow i found myself through long afternoons writing a biography of queen victoria in six london county council notebooks and i remember mr beale reading them and saying i'm going to show these to mr scott mr scott is actually a historian he said so mr scott mr scott must have done a degree in history but i was really encouraged and i was responded to as a writer practically from the time i learned to write my name and I think it's given me uh, a sense of responsibility somehow that I must, um, God, I'm feeling quite sentimental. I must do the same, I mean, in some way, I must, um, I must keep that system going. If I can, in well, I, I do, I suppose, in my, in my teaching, particularly with a graduate student. But I think what uh, writers do need readers. And because I had good readers of various kinds, I, I want to be a good reader of other, of students' writing. So That's a very powerful answer, because it, as, as I said, I, I think there's a generosity to the way that you read this material that is, that's remarkable. It's not evidence for some pre-formulated project. Mm. And in that way of writing, I think it's very instructive for readers. That's why I found it very useful to use it in training teachers, to say there's a, there's a way of reading that is responsive. So, so can we now get to this question of how you distinguish between this, and I, and I say I do take that really seriously, with what it would mean in your mind to be a writer, because you've just described what it means to be a reader. Okay. And actually a teacher. It's also a kind of everyday cultural joke in the UK where we all say, you know, in our 60s, when I grow up, I really am going to get a decent oven, you know, which means that, <laughs> that you... I love that. You, it, mean, it means that you really... <laughs> it's an admission of some kind of failure with your oven. <laughs> so it was that kind of... That was the voice in which I was saying it. I have been, I was asked to reflect on these questions recently by a couple of US editors putting together a book on writing across the disciplines that okay. was originally called How We Write. I have a kind of bloody-minded ornery um, <laughs> enjoyment in working within the constraints, the kind of rhetorical constraints of formal academic history writing, yeah. I don't think that I ever really break those boundaries. Mm -hmm. But I, I take a lot of pleasure in going as far as I can with the form, yes. if you like. Yeah really pushing up against the edge. And I sometimes think I've been extremely lucky. So I, I try very hard. I work at it. I think I know what I'm doing, writing what presents itself as a piece of academic history writing, but uh, taking some rather limited risks with structure and voice. And I, I think I've got away with it. I am really looking forward to retiring when I no longer have to think about what will happen to me as a writer. I'm actually quite excited and I don't get excited about many things. I have no idea how uh, I will find a different voice or how I will go about writing or indeed what I'll write about. Now, of course, I do know that what happens <laughs> in a great many retirements is that people just stop altogether. So there is that fear. You know, it's of exciting because it's also completely unknown 
territory. But I have that idea as a kind of little golden image just ahead, just a little further down the path. I, I've had a fantasy ever since I first went to university that what I really want to write is poetry. Now, the last poetry I wrote was when I was 18, and believe me... We've read it before. <laughs> you <laughs> certainly have. You've read it. <laughs> but it's, it's, been, it's been a little motto for me, or an mm -hmm. emblem. I am entranced and um, enraptured by um, W.H. Auden's homage to Cleo and what I think I've seen mm -hmm. is a whole cycle of history poems about mm. poetry, about the historical process and poetry about historiography, all produced between about 1938 and 1965. They're in... Um, things, objects, makers of history, and of course, homage to Cleo, which is the great, extraordinary, long paean of praise to the muse of history. And I copy these out often. I say them to myself. You know, I know them by heart. I, in tedious car journeys, or actually in... Limo yeah. rides to Newark. <laughs> <laughs> Limo rides to Newark. Mm -hmm. I say this poetry to my... I want to write about it. It's, it's the closest I can get. I want to understand not the poetics of history, but the poetry of history. Yeah. And so I do have a plan for when I um, retire. Though I've just said I have, I have no idea what it will be like to be released from the bondage of the research excellence framework. I actually do have an idea. It, it makes perfect sense to me, actually, because, you know, when I, in my mind, when I imagine a way of describing your way of reading and, and your method, your historic mm -hmm. method, I feel that you have a poetic of reading, that, that you are able to lift the poetry out of the material mm -hmm. that's in front of us and make it, I mean, in, in, a, in a certain way, you make Anne Mead's story beautiful. Mm, yes. And, you know, um, of course, the tidy house ends with the flower girl. Which, Watercress, Bella. Uh, oh, no, oh, flower girl. You know, I haven't looked uh, no, at I'm sure you such have a, a long time. Yes. Um, <laughs> Tell well, me about well, you it. Well, <laughs> you might be interested to know that you return to the stu the stu one of the students who writes the tidy house. Yes. And she herself had, had done a lot of free writing. Yes. And she writes this poem that's about the flower girl and that she's imagining a life for herself. One evening when it was very dark, flower lady sang the sweetest song she'd ever made. It went like this. My name is flower lady. You may like me. Maybe you like me better than a bee. And I love trees and bumblebees. Then she went to bed and had a dream about songs and laughter. Oh, what a night. And, I mean, I th again, when I, I talk... I remember it now. It's extraordinary, isn't it? I have the original text, I'm, you know, in a filing cabinet. I, 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 it's a treasure, I would say. And, <laughs> and again, when I talk about the courage of this book, I just think, we're two paragraphs from the end of the book, yes. and you've turned it over to a, a very young writer mm -hmm. who's writing poetry to capture, actually not in me, but an aspiration towards yes. beauty. It is. It, right? it is. The intention is beauty there. Yeah. And so I, I actually, I think that's fantastic. I would love to read you writing about it, because poetry obviously is not without constraint. You would just have different constraints. Well, thank you. <laughs> this is my first public announcement. <laughs> <laughs> you, you write about yourself as an optimist. and, and I think that's what's so powerful about your work is that you you confront the hard edge of reality, but it doesn't dull your own optimism. Thank you so much. Well, really thank wonderful you. to talk I to you. I did enjoy that. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Time with the Creative Mind. 
hope you'll check out the other podcasts in our series and that you'll drop us a line.